Welcome to the audio lecture on Chinese art and culture before the year 1279. This is part two. When we ended part one, we were talking about the Warring States period, which is from about 480 to 221 BC. Now during this time, there was a lot of turmoil in China, but at the same time, this time period gave birth to the primary philosophies that have really shaped Chinese thought since that time. So to begin our exploration into the second part of ancient China, let's talk about those philosophies. First, let's talk about the Tao Te Ching, or the Tao. And sometime around 500 BC, according to the stories, there lived an ancient uh, mystic named Lao Tzu. And Lao Tzu wrote a very uh, compact little book of 81 poems. I'd like to say the first one that comes to mind as I talk about the Tao Te Ching. She who talks does not know, and she who knows does not talk. So with that, I guess I'm already confessing that I really don't know the great answers to life's uh, profound questions, but I can tell you that the Tao Te Ching offers some beautiful advice as to how to live. The poetry is kind of cryptic, but it basically points to the Tao, or the Way, which is um, akin to the rhythm of nature. We have something called Qi, or life force, that flows through all of nature. And I really suggest anyone who is not familiar with this work to pick it up. And one thing I'll mention is that it is spelled with a D sometimes and with a T at others. What we're looking at on the left is a very early version of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, the first versions were found around 500 BC. And I think I'll say one more little poem from this, uh, one more nugget from the book, and then we'll move on to talk about Chuang Tzu, who also helped to form the uh, basis of Taoist thought. Now why this is important to our study is because there's a whole school of painting that's based on the Wei or the Tao. So here's the next poem from the Tao Te Ching. The way that can be told is not the way. The names that can be named, they're not the real names. Heaven and earth are born from the mother of the name and the 10,000 things are born from the mother of the name, each after its own kind. So that's a bit cryptic, but it also can open the mind to new ways of thinking. So in addition to um, Lao Tzu, who was the philosopher who wrote the Tao Te Ching, we have Chuang Tzu, who wrote a book simply titled Chuang Tzu. And this is uh, supposedly a picture of him on the right. I guess he's conversing with a frog. And he had a little bit more of a wry sense of humor. One of quote from him is he said, Where can I find a man who has forgotten words? Now he is the one that I would like to talk to. So these two volumes, when taken together, form the basis for Taoism, which is, um, I don't know if you could really even call it a religion. It's more like a way of thinking, a way of interacting with the world, that is probably applicable to many different religions. Now, in addition to Taoism, we have Confucianism. And I think the unschooled might get these confused, but they're really quite different. Confucius lived in around 500 BC. He was born 551 BC. And from his earliest uh, days as a teenager, according to the story, he wanted to be a scholar. He started studying very, very deeply when still a teenager and was teaching in his early 20s. Now, at the time that he was alive, China was really in turmoil, and Confucius despaired of how the world could be put in order. How could people simply treat each other better and have a society that functioned more fully? So, in his lifetime, he didn't really see this, but he continued to teach until he was an old man and he died. Upon his death, his students and their students wrote down uh, transcripts of the conversations that Confucius had had with them. These are called the Analects, and this is really the basic Confucian text. Now, Confucianism is, Confucianism is really a little bit more concerned with how we treat each other 
there's a, a concept called Ren, which could be called human heartedness. And it means that way of living with morality and empathy. And the person who has a strong Ren, they will be what is called a superior person. In a lot of the old books, they call it the superior man. Now, this person is going to show moderation, integrity, loyalty, and is primarily concerned with achieving justice in things. There's another part of Confucianism called uh, Li, or that would be etiquette, and it is simply treating your fellow humans with respect. This emphasis on treating others with kindness and dignity and uh, living with morality served to really help to maintain social order in ancient China. And in addition, in Confucianism, there is a focus on the family, on the roles within the family, with the father as head of household, the woman attending to the duties of the wife, etc. And this really helped order to be maintained in society also. The children were really morally bound to take care of their parents and to respect them as they aged. So there we have the two foundational stones, you could say, of Chinese, of ancient Chinese thought. And that's really still prevalent to this day. That would be on the one hand, there's Taoism, which was basically founded on the writings of Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu. And then we have Confucianism, which is founded on the, the dialogue that Confucius had with his students as transcribed in something called the Analects. Now during the Cultural Revolution in the 20th century, this kind of thinking was really seen as being uh, transgressive and was discouraged, but there's been quite a resurgence since the fall of Mao. So now let's look at how this might apply to art. We'll begin by looking at a painted banner that really walk, marks the end of what's called the mythocentric um, era in Chinese beliefs. And this is basically um, holding animals as symbolic of, of the supernatural realm and having supernatural powers. And this one's a little bit hard to see, but here the woman who has died is pictured and all the heavenly creatures are above, as well as all of these representatives of where she has been and her earthly life are below. So both the previous piece and this piece were created during the Han Dynasty, which came to power in 206 in the current era. Now with the Han, Chinese achieved a great period of prosperity, stability, and peace, and the Silk Road opened. Now, the creation of silk in China had been going on for centuries and had been prized even in Greece and Rome as far back as the 3rd century BC. But with the opening of the Silk Road, China really um, gained a lot more access to the wider world. So in contrast to the banner that we just saw, let's take a look at this incense burner. And again, you have to use your imagination and I'll sort of tell you what we're looking at. One of the features of Taoism and of the Taoists is that they were fascinated with immortality. There were Taoist legends of the great eastern land where the immortals came to walk upon the earth. Now the concept of immortality, that's a whole other notion if you look at it from a Buddhist point of view, which one could say we're in this eternal present moment. But that's a little different subject. What we're looking at here is an incense burner from a tomb and it depicts mountains and clouds and immortals climbing up that mountain. And of course, when there was incense burning, then there would be mist and fog in the mountains as well. Okay, so this next one I just think is amazing because it's one of the really few versions of, uh, it's a sample of the architecture of the time. And they said that the Han kingdoms had elaborate painting on the walls, were, had lacquer and precious stones. But let's take a moment and look at what we can find out about the architecture from this tomb model. First, I've got to point out, there's the dog, okay? guarding the door. Right there is the little doggy. So what we have is a seven-story structure. And how many of them lived would be that the animals would be on the ground floor. 
This second floor was probably used for storage. And then the family would live up above with this little tower here connected by a little walkway. So this gives us a hint uh, of how the housing might have looked. Another thing that we can sort of see here and that we'll see more in temples is something called bracketing that is unique to Asian architecture, to Chinese and Japanese architecture primarily. And that's these features that hold the tile roofs and they, they come out under the eaves. And we'll look at those a little bit more as we look at the temples. I'd like to talk for a minute about the role that Confucianism played in um, really Chinese political life. So the Han leaders, they figured out early on that by adapting the practices of Confucianism, which means re uh, holding the leaders in reverence, honoring father and mother, living morally, etc., if they honored these precepts and made that the state religion, then that would go a long way towards maintaining control. So they did that. Um, during the Han Dynasty, Confucianism was made the state religion. And you know, it stayed the state religion for 2,000 years. Um, as I said before, during the Cultural Revolution, it was minimized. But even today, the whole idea of the respect for elders, the way that you keep order in society, etc. It really holds a strong place within China. It's as if it's permeated the culture in a way that really um, is there to stay. So in the ever-changing constant of dynasties in uh, early China, the Han eventually fell and they were followed by a period in 220 AD. They were followed by a period called the Six Dynasties, which really represented almost constant uh, low-level warfare in both northern and southern China. Now at this point, northern China and southern China really separated and became almost like two countries. Um, and it was also interesting that during this time, Confucianism kind of took went to the back burner and Taoism again became a primary focus of spiritual life. It makes sense that when people are in real difficulty, they usually turn to these abstract uh, metaphysical concepts to provide a balm to get them through the tough times. However, what we're looking at here really reflects more of the Confucian ideology. And I just think it's hilarious and also, gee, hard to see. So what's happening here is that here's the big mean circus bear, which I don't know, to me it looks a little bit more like a muskrat, but it's a big bear and it's going to attack the emperor who is here. Ah, but his wife, she is rushing to get between the bear and her husband. Even as these scared guards try to fight it, she is the one who shows courage because like a good Confucian wife, she um, is dedicated to her husband above all else. What we're also seeing here is the beginning of the formal Chinese painting style. We see it more in landscapes that we'll look at a little bit later on. But I'd like to share the first two of six principles that were put forth by the scholar Zi He uh, as the ideals for that the painter should follow. And the first one is called spirit consonance, which what that means is that the artist needs to be tuned in to what they call qi, qi, or life force. And by cultivating the qi within themselves, the artist can then transfer this to the painting, and the painting will have strong energy, so to speak. The other principle that I'd like to share is called the bones of the painting. And that's something that we're looking at here. The bones are the brush strokes. They're really the means, so to speak, for the artist to uh, transfer their chi to the painting is through how they move the brush. As a painting instructor I can say that so much of learning to paint is simply learning to handle a brush. There's no mystery to it. But let's look more at what we mean by handling the brush. Chinese calligraphy is a valid art form in its own right. I'd like you to notice here that these are these seals or stamps which are, um, they're like rubber stamps, right? And the black is actually done with a brush. Now each of these uh, letters 
each of these words originally had, were pictures that eventually got simplified down and turned into these letters. But they have a very strong uh, range of meanings that really, it, it would take a whole English sentence to write often. And you probably know this, but this is read top to bottom. Oh look, so now we have Confucianism, Taoism, and here come the Buddhists. As we discussed in an earlier lesson, Buddhism originated in the 5th century in India. But now that the Silk Road was opened, well, it spread to China. Chinese Buddhism is slightly different in that it's also got Taoist influences. Most of the early Buddhist temples are gone from the six dynasties. But here we have an example from these rock-cut temples. Now, throughout northern China in particular, there were hundreds of these temple complexes that were carved out of solid rock. They would make these caves that were man-made caves. What's fascinating about this example is that it used to be covered. So all that you see here, the writing, the Buddha, these little bitty monks' cells, which are actually where monks would meditate, they were all inside of a cave. And then the front of it fell off. So now we can see it. And this is just one of many Buddhas at this complex. And one thing to consider is that this fella is 45 t feet tall. So down here, you know, a person would stand to about here. Um, this style still does represent um, a lot of what we would see in the in the Indian influences also, the Southeast Asian Buddhas. But that will change in China as China develops its own style. As we move into the current millennium, we have a constant fluctuation, rising and falling of dynasties. First with the Sui and the Tang dynasty, and then moving on. What we're looking at now is from another cave complex, and that would be the cave complex at Dunhuang. This was a complex of over 500 caves that were all carved by hand out of the sandy rock. It was a major stop on the Silk Road. This particular image uh, depicts the Amitabha Buddha. <laughs> Let me say that again. Amitabha Buddha. And the Amitabha Buddha is uh, featured in Pure Land Buddhism. By this time, Buddhism had spread throughout China and was really the major religion. This particular branch of Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, promises rebirth in the great western paradise upon death to the uh, followers of this religion. So it's the age-old story of redemption for our suffering on the other side. One thing that we also see really around the world and that happened here was the uh, inevitable backlash. As Buddhism gained more power, those that were ruling decided it had too much power. And it was seen as a foreign religion, and Confucianism was again made this prominent, predominant state religion. And unfortunately, during that time of the, the backlash against Buddhism, many of the temples were destroyed. However, we do still have a few prime examples of early Buddhist temples. This example at Nanchan shows us some of the things that we see pretty much throughout Chinese architecture. So here we have a slight curving of the roof. And an interesting feature here are these modules. These are these sort of prefabricated um, sections that are put together to create a structure. This is a model that we've seen uh, repeated really throughout China and then later in Japan as they really admired and copied Chinese architecture. So here's another example of a temple that's really survived from the Tang dynasty. And one thing that we can say about the Tang is that in general they preach religious tolerance, although they were followed by a dynasty that went the other direction. So this one shows such a harmony of form, doesn't it? It's seven stories tall, and it was built to honor a monk after he returned from a 16-year pilgrimage. These are interesting because they're really copying the East Indian uh, stupas that we see. And um, it's designed also to kind of copy a watchtower. So there's a philosophy that says when one is in meditation, they're watching over all of life as if someone, they're someone in a tall tower. 
So the paintings of the Tang period were also really highly prized and they were known for their figure painting. What we're looking at here is a copy uh, from someone in a later period. But this is just delightful. It's called Ladies Preparing Newly Woven Silk. And as they roll the silk, I like the fact that there's that little child looking up at it. So this is a good example of Chinese figure painting. And now let's look at the figurative sculpture of the Tang Dynasty. Whenever I see these kind of clay figures, I stop and marvel at the skill of the artisan because clay has to be fired and it has to be fired at an even temperature. So this can be really challenging to create figures that are at this height, which these are about mm, 14 to 16 inches tall, and to have them go through the firing process without breaking, not to mention they've lasted all of this time. So here we can see the naturalism of the Tang artists. And we'll look at a little different one here. This is a beautiful one that's from the Tang dynasty also. This ceramic sculpture demonstrates the great liberal changes that came in China at the, during the Tang Dynasty. Here, if you look closely, there's a couple of guys with beards and a couple of clean-shaven people riding this uh, camel. They're also playing a musical instrument that came from Central Asia and became part of China, of Chinese culture. Now, when you look at the bearded people, they're from Turkey culture. So they're from Central Asia. And the two clean-shaven are Han Chinese. So not only is this depicting um, musicians from a distant land, it's depicting them making music with the people of China. This particular piece is from a museum in China. But I encourage you all to go to the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, where they have a wonderful collection of similar sculptures. You know, another treasure of the Nelson Atkins Museum is this. Here we have the seated Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. This particular sculpture is located in a reconstructed temple within the museum. So why, while here we see a white background, when you see this piece in person, it has um, an authentic ba a wall of a temple behind it, as is the ceiling and the whole room is enclosed. It's a, this figure stands, let's see if it says, it's about seven and a half feet tall. So it's very imposing and a powerful presence, really, to go sit in front of this. And whatever your belief system, you will gain a feeling of peace, I'm sure, if you're ever able to go and sit with this Kuan Yin. And let's see, what about the history of this sculpture? Well, this figure was created during the Song Dynasty, actually in a time of great upheaval in China. And as we've said before, often some very uh, deep philosophical truths, or as in this case, beautiful art, comes out of times of profound conflict. And what this figure stands for is that aspect of infinite compassion, which really radiates from it when you see it in person, and perhaps you can even get a feeling of that when you see this wooden sculpture. So now let's take a moment and consider architecture. When we looked at the Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, we saw the stupas, the early stupas of the Buddhas, of the Buddhists, which they would circumambulate, they would walk around it. Well, later, stupas got a little bit of height in Central Asia, and then led to the watchtowers, which we see in 200 BC. And you can see in the two on the right how the pagoda developed. And they still maintain, though, this central axis and this upward uh, kind of feeling to the architecture. So when you look at these tall pagodas today, it can be interesting to consider that they started with the stupa and just sort of grew heavenward, so to speak. Now let's take a moment and look at the painting from the Song Dynasty, which came after the Tang Dynasty. We're going to look at just a few here as we consider what we discussed earlier in the, the Taoist uh, study of painting. Now if you think about the Taoist love of nature, really one could go out into nature and be absorbed in that uh, rhythm of life, the qi, so to speak. But in this belief system, someone could also look into a painting and achieve the same effect. What's important to notice about this one is, for one thing, it's seven feet tall, 
huge. And we have a foreground, a midground, and a background. The artist has done a masterful job of leaving this area unpainted to give a feeling of mist. Now the next one we'll look at is a hand scroll. And these are important to understand in that they were not meant to be looked at as we're looking at now. They were a scroll, so they had a post on either end and they were rolled up. And the viewer was supposed to go through them to unfold the scene uh, bit by bit as they explored this uh, great look into nature. What's important to notice here is what we call depth of field or atmospheric perspective. This artist has really done a masterful job of creating depth in these mountains by making them more um, hazy and less contrasting. Here we have one that we opened the first slideshow with, and it's Spring Festival on the River. If you can return to that original opening slide, you can see it better, but it's such a beautiful piece. If you look closely, you'll see there's all the um, tents for the vendors, there's all these people, and it has so many little details of the oxen and the children playing and the musicians. It really gives us a sense of daily life during the Northern Song Dynasty. All these are from the Song Dynasty, which had a rich painting tradition, even as it was a rather unstable period in Chinese history. So here's one more, and I'd like you to notice here the difference. Notice how it has such a feeling of peace and open expanse. The artist need not fill the entire uh, scroll or canvas. Really, they just need to paint masterfully with um, dedicated brush strokes in order to achieve the effect. And lastly, here is one more landscape. And this one is more obviously um, inspired, influenced by uh, Buddhism, by what they call Chan Buddhism, or we know it more in the West as Zen Buddhism which is the taking away of what is not necessary and the clearing of the mind, as is made obvious uh, by the really limited subject matter in this piece. So let's take a moment and jump over to Korea before we close out the slideshow. Here we have a crown from the 6th century. Now let's consider Korea. It's located on a peninsula between Japan and China, and yet it's had its own unique art forms and um, really civilization for millennia. Throughout, uh, from about 50 BC to about 700 Common Era, there was something called the Three Kingdoms period, in which Korea was really divided into three distinct uh, cultures. And this one is from the Silla Kingdom. Now when you look at this, you can consider that this crown has got gold and jewels and is probably pretty heavy. It's, it's 17 inches tall. But the good news is that you wouldn't really have to wear it standing up because it would be put on at death as it was put on the deceased and buried with them in the tomb. But it's really an exquisite work for someone to wear into the afterlife. Now this next one that we'll look at is a ceremonial stand. These stands are made of a gray, unglazed uh, stoneware. This particular puppy is about two feet tall, and we don't really know what it was used for, but note the simple decorations. Quite probably it was used for some sort of a ceremonial purpose. So now we're going to have the introduction of Buddhism into Korea. Buddhism came to Korea from China in about 375 A.D. First it came to the Northern Kingdom and then it spread throughout Korea. Here we have an example of how the Koreans made their own style of depicting the Buddhas. At first they all copied China, but then they developed something that was quite distinctive. And then Japan eventually got Buddhism from Korea. Here's another Buddha that's rather different. This one has such a um, you know, a really refined form. It's highly smoothed and polished and it represents a more naturalistic style in Korea's depiction of the Buddha. But let's back up for one second. Here's a Bodhisattva, which is an enlightened being, and here's a depiction of the Buddha. So they're really two different figures from Buddhism. 
Now lastly, let's take a look at the ceramics that is really a unique style to the Korean Peninsula. This piece is done with something called a celadon glaze that was first developed in China, but the Koreans, they really made it their own. And this is a thick glaze that's applied over stoneware. And in general, the Korean decoration was quite simple. And when they did add decoration, as we see here, it was done with slip that was actually, which, oh, slip would be a liquid colored clay that would be actually incised and inlaid into the ceramic. Throughout the years, the Koreans really developed their own style, unique of the Chinese ceramics, and they became really quite well known for that. So now we'll end our long journey through the philosophy, culture, and art of ancient China and Korea by looking once again at a Kuan Yin, which is the Bodhisattva of Compassion. This is an example of the unique uh, Korean Buddhist painting style, which is really how many of the Buddhas were created in the later kingdoms of ancient Korea. So perhaps this spirit of compassion will emanate from the Bodhisattvas into your day. And all I can say after that is thanks for listening.